to speak uh, at the conference today. So thank you very much to the conference organizers for organizing the, the virtual meeting and for accepting our panel on translation and humanitarian action. Um, so I'm, I'm currently a postdoctoral research fellow at Dublin City University and I'm working on a project called Translation as Empowerment with uh, a humanitarian NGO called Go. But today I'm actually going to speak about uh, research that I've done previously and that I'm building on in my current project. So that project that I worked on uh, was called the Listening Zones of NGOs, Languages and Cultural Knowledge in Development Programs. Um, and this was uh, a three-year uh, research a project that was interdisciplinary, a collaborative between uh, the University of Reading and Portsmouth with uh, INTRAC, which is an international NGO training and research centre. And we worked closely with uh, Save the Children UK, Oxfam GP, Tear Fund and Christian Aid in this project. And the, the idea, the starting point of the project was that international uh, development NGOs, like the four that I mentioned, tend to position themselves as listening to the local communities that uh, they assist in humanitarian and development aid. Um, but that within this listening, um, they rarely mention the role that languages and translation play. Now, English tends to be used as the lingua franca in the international aid sector. Um, and we found through our research that um, languages tend to have a low profile in these organizations. So when they plan projects and when they monitor and deliver their projects and evaluate them, they do not tend to consider the language or translation needs that they will uh, come across in order to successfully work with local communities. So this is something that we were interested in uh, to understand this not only in the present day, what effect does this have on the projects that NGOs are delivering and on their aims and the values that they claim to represent, such as working inclusively. Um, but we also wanted to know how these approaches to languages and translation had developed over time. So there was a historical component to the project. And that's uh, what I want to talk about today. So in the, in the book that we recently published that you see an image of here, which is called Development NGOs and Languages, Listening Power and Inclusion, there, is, uh, there are two chapters on this historical context in which we investigate how these NGOs and also funding agencies listened to their communities they worked with over time and the role of language and translation. But out of the four NGOs that I mentioned that we studied, uh, we didn't include anything on Save the Children UK. And Save the Children was the NGO that I did the archival research on. And the reason we didn't, we didn't include it in the end, one of them was that I found very little. <laughs> and this is basically what I want to do in the paper today. I'm trying to revisit the material and see what we can learn from the little evidence that I found. So I want to test out some of those ideas today and see what story I can tell you. So uh, first of all, I wanted to say more on the archival material that I looked at. So because we looked at these four NGOs and the three other ones um, were founded later in sort of uh, Second World War or after, uh, we decided to look at archival material from the 90s, 1950s onwards. Obviously, Save the Children is older. It's one of the, the oldest humanitarian organizations. It was founded in 1919. So for this older uh, period, I mainly relied on secondary literature, and I'll be referring to that literature in the first part of my paper today. In terms of the archival material, things I looked at were, for example, meeting minutes of the Overseas Relief and Welfare Committee. I looked at country reports from three countries because we were uh, doing three case studies. So we looked at material on Kyrgyzstan, Malawi, and Peru. Uh, I looked at annual reports, council meetings, executive committee meetings and papers organizational strategy and policy documents, and any type of document in which the title mentioned language and listening. I worked on the selection of this material with the archivist, and it's an approach that was similar to all of the NGOs uh, we looked at as well. So like I said, um, I'm first going to talk about the early period of Save the Children, and for this I'm mainly basing myself on secondary uh, sources that I've consulted. 
So the most interesting story about uh, Save the Children, and probably the reason why it was then disappointing to find so little about language and translation in the later archival material, is that there, there is a claim that you can make that Save the Children was actually found in translation. Um, and you see a picture here of uh, one of the founders called Eglantine Jeb. Um, and in the biography uh, written by Claire Murley on uh, Eglantine Jeb, there's actually a chapter called Found in Translation. So um, Save the Children was found by two sisters, Eglantine Jeb and Dorothy Buxton. So the story goes that during the First World War, Dorothy Buxton was dissatisfied with the news coverage of the war in the UK newspapers. And she managed to obtain permission through her personal network, which included various uh, influential politicians, to get permission to import 25 foreign newspapers from neutral and enemy countries uh, into the UK. And she then set up a translation headquarters in her attic, inviting her friends, like-minded friends who were speaking other languages, uh, to start translating these foreign news articles into other languages, uh, into English, from other languages into English. Uh, Claire Mully writes about this uh, in her biography, that things quickly snowballed and soon uh, Dorothy Buxton was supervising a major operation with large teams of voluntary linguists and specialists in current affairs, translating over a hundred papers a week imported from France, Germany, Austria, Italy, Russia, Hungary, Romania, and Finland. Um, so they started translating these articles and they started to be uh, published as well. So there was, uh, this was a really important way in the UK at the time to be able to access news of what was going on uh, in other countries uh, in terms of the war. Uh, and after the war, Dorothy and uh, her friends continued to be worried uh, about the, the economic blockade that was taking place in Europe. And they, they continued translating um, news material and they used this as sort of an information campaign um, to inform the new campaign that they had set up, which was the Fight the Femine Council. And this is where um, the foundation of Save the Children is coming closer. Uh, Eglantine Jeb, Dorothy's sister, uh, produced a number of leaflets with pictures of star starving babies under the headline, Our Blockade Has Caused This, Millions of Children Are star Starving to Death. And she distributed these leaflets in London on Trafalgar Square, and she was arrested for doing this without uh, getting clearance to do so from government censors. She was fined five pounds, but the, the prosecuting counsel symbolically donated her fine back to her. And this was when Eglantine Jeb and Dorothy Boxton set up a new relief fund that would be called the Save the Children Fund. Um, so you can see that it was the act of translation that ultimately led to the foundation of this new organization. And language and translation also continue to play an important role in the next few years of the existence of the organization. So the next thing that happened is that Eglantine Jeb set up an international um, branch of Save the Children. She founded Save the Children Fund International Union, which at the time was in Geneva, because she considered the work of Save the Children as an opportunity that could gain widespread support, considering it as apolitical, which obviously in later years would become uh, more problematic. But she considered it as a campaign that could gain international support. And she saw campaigning for the child as a way of uniting nations and fostering reconciliation in the aftermath of war. Um, she she uh, said, according to uh, several sources, that the only international language in the world is a child's cry. Um, and so this was her reasoning and her motivation for founding the international branch. The next thing she did was draft the Declaration of the Rights of the Child, which would later be adopted by the League of Nations and which would ultimately serve as the basis for the UN Declaration of the Rights of the Child in 1959 and later on for the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in 1989. So the, the legend is that uh, Jeb sat on a mountain in Geneva and inspiration came to her and she drafted the Declaration 
of the rights of the child. In terms of language, she drafted this in English, but she also worked closely in the following year with Save the Children's International branch on producing a French version. Now, Save the Children was very keen to have this declaration adopted by the League of Nations so that it would um, gain strong international support. So once they agreed on a definitive version in English and in French, the international branch had the declaration translated into 37 languages and sent it to all the members of the Assembly of the League of Nations, asking for their support in adopting it. Now, the official languages of the League of Nations at the time were French and English, so the translations were a deliberate move from Save the Children International Union to maximize the Declaration's vis visibility and increase potential support for it. The last um, thing I want to share, oh, this is a picture of the Declaration uh, in English and in French. The last uh, aspect I wanted to share about these declarations um, is that a few years later, when a Save the Children International was organizing a conference on um, the, the African child in Geneva, um, the, the magazine of Save the Children UK called The World's Children published six translations of the Declaration of Geneva in African languages. And you can see that here um, on the slides. Now, what is interesting about this, and this is something that I did come across when I did uh, my archival research, is that it was one of the very few local language traces that I could find in the archive. So 95% um, of the documents that I consulted were in English, a few of them were in Spanish, sometimes in other large lingua franca like Russian or French, but there was very little uh, in terms of locally used uh, languages. So this was uh, interesting to come across this, and it, it can be considered as a form of tokenism, save the children wanting to show that it was working for uh, people around the world. And there's obviously um, a colonial legacy to this as well. Um, but what I find interesting is that, uh, in fact, um, this early translation shows an early pattern of translation that was unidirectional, going from English, in which uh, information and knowledge was produced in English, and then it would flow from countries in the global north to countries in the global south, and translation would take place later. It also shows that in this case, it was a choice of Save the Children to produce these translations, but usually the burden of translation is placed on actors within uh, developing countries to translate material in their own uh, local languages. Uh, and I'll put that in some more context later on. So what did I find then in my archival uh, research? Um, I've come up with a list of what I would call language traces. They were very brief mentions of the role of language and translation in uh, the work that Save the Children were doing. So these are two examples from the 1960s. They're both taken from minutes from the Overseas Advisory Committee. So for example, in this discussions on Algeria, there was a discussion about the best way the Save the Children Fund could help uh, Algeria and the work that it was doing in Algeria. And it discussed that it would be good if uh, Save the Children could send a French speaking nurse. Um, but they then discussed that a working knowledge of French would be sufficient because it was very difficult to find French speaking personnel. Uh, two years later in a discussion on Ethiopia, um, the, the um, advisory committee, the overseas advisory committee was discussing sending someone from Save the Children to provide training in a local hospital. And the meeting minutes stated that there would be no language difficulties as the Ethiopian staff of the hospital was bilingual and the hospital was at present run on English hospital lines. So this already gives you the impression that headquarters especially, but also wider in the staff that uh, Save the Children UK was sending overseas, it was difficult to find other language skills than English. In the 1970s, uh, I came across a discussion that was about a child sponsors, sponsorship scheme that Save the Children was running. Uh, and Save the Children at the time was taking over the sponsorship scheme that was being run by the international branch because they were stopping their sponsorship scheme. 
and discussions in the archives noted that some of the sponsors of these uh, children did not speak English and this would be problematic for Save the Children UK and the archive, the archival documents noted that we could run into translation difficulties. So the response from the international branch to this was that during the first and second quarters of 1973, we will do our utmost best to weed out cases near termination on grounds of age of children or lack of need. And fortuitously, a number of these cases are children sponsored by non-English speaking donors. So I guess there's an interesting parallel here between um, the previous paper that we listened to and how children were being selected on the basis of the language skills that they had. So in this case, it's the sponsors of the children who are being selected for being English speakers. Um, it's only really in the 1990s that uh, discussions about language and translation become more closely linked to the strategic direction and the development of the organization. So in the 1990s in Save the Children, there is a process going on of what they call regionalization. Um, and the, the organization is also trying to extend its work in Latin America. So discussions uh, around this, for example, state that this region was unlike any other region in which Save the Children UK worked, not least because of the obvious language factor. Speaking English was not enough. Uh, and these discussions went on to say that the committee acknowledged the language problem, but felt that the regional office to play an important part in minimizing this by enabling field offices to look for support within the region rather than in London where Spanish and Portuguese might not be spoken. So again, you get this sense that English was the language that headquarters functioned in at the time, and it would have been difficult to find any staff within headquarters that spoke uh, Spanish or Portuguese. And this is something that has changed quite a bit today, I would say. Um, what was interesting though, and that's one of the points I wanted to make, is that, um, that this was sort of where the evidence about language and translation stopped in the archives. But when I spoke to staff from Save the Children, I found out that actually Save the Children UK had had a language and translation policy in place since 1997. It's just that it wasn't in the archives. So I managed to get a copy of the, the 2003 policy, which was an updated version and describes in its introduction that in 1997, Save the Children UK put a language and translation policy in place as a result of comprehensive research into the issue of language and its implications for the organization. So it's interesting to note that not only was the policy not there, but also the comprehensive research and I imagine these discussions around this that would have taken place, none of them were archived, even though much of the material that I looked at was from this period, 1997 and the years before. There were a lot of documents that discussed um, how Save the Children was transforming itself into a global movement, um, the branding that they were designing and using around that communication strategies, organizational um, strategy policy documents and so on, but there was nothing around language. So it shows that um, archives always tell a story and that perhaps if we are looking for uh, traces of language and translation practices, an archive is not necessarily the best place to look for that evidence. Um, but I think to me personally, it was, it was a surprise that these documents, which were policy documents and linked to the strategy of the, the organization, hadn't made it into the archives. And we saw a big contrast with the archives from Ox Oxfam GB, for example, where this sort of material uh, had all been uh, deposited to the Bodleian, where uh, Oxfam's archives are based. So these are, for me, are the two takeaways. It's the fact that the archive tells a selective story and that it's important, especially for research on language and translation to supplement the archival data with things like oral history interviews. Um, but what was also important and uh, interesting about what we did find is that um, we saw that the creation of this policy of Save the Children came at similar moments in history as it has come in other 
NGOs. So the previous paper in this, in this panel already said that um, a language and translation policies uh, don't tend to uh, exist widespread in international organizations. But some of the organizations do have them, like Oxfam GB, like Tier Fund, and like Amnesty International. And for all of these, these policies were created at uh, moments in organizational history when organizations try to decentralize power, they try to globalize and come across as one global movement, uh, and so on. So there had been a period of organizational expansion where um, the organization grew in size, it started working in more geographically diverse areas. So there came a point at which the ad hoc approach to language and translation that they had been using for many years wasn't enough anymore. And they needed something that would be more efficient and more streamlined. And that could also mean that the messaging of the organization was uh, better maintained across uh, several languages. Um, so um, this is uh, everything I wanted um, to share with you. So I look forward to uh, the panel discussion. Thank you. Mm -hmm.